Welcome to Cafe Scientifique Silicon Valley at SRI International. I'm Marty Ritchie from SRI's corporate communications team, and uh, we're all very glad to have you here tonight. Uh, please note we will not have an event in July, but we hope you can join us again on August 12th when we hope to feature researchers from our Center for Geospace Studies here at SRI International. Watch your email and visit the CAFE website for information to come. You can also watch past CAFE events on our YouTube channel. The web address is listed on SRI bookmarks that you can pick up on your way out tonight. There's one. Thank you. <laughs> Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Zoback, Professor of Geophysics at Stanford University. Dr. Zoback conducts research on fault mechanics and reservoir geomechanics with an emphasis on shale gas, tight gas, and tight oil production. Dr. Zoback is the author or co-author of 300 technical papers and holds five patents. In 1996, he co-founded an oil and gas reservoir consulting firm. We'll hear tonight from Dr. Zoback about the oil and gas production technique known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And the topic's everywhere, as I'm sure you know, uh, in the media, from New York Times to Sunset Magazine is covering this important topic. So tonight, let's learn more about it, and um, Dr. Zoback will discuss its, discuss its promise, plus steps that can be taken to assure that resources are developed in an environmentally responsive, responsible manner. Dr. Zoback will take your questions at the, end, at the conclusion of his presentation. So that everyone can hear you, please use one of the microphones in the back of the room that will be set up. And then without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Zoback to the podium. Well, thanks, Marty, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, uh, happy to be here. Uh, since the title of my talk is a question, and, and this is a talk and not a mystery novel, uh, the answer is yes, um, so let, let's move on. Um, what I want to talk about today is a little bit about uh, the larger scale picture. Stand way back and look at the large picture of uh, atmospheric CO2 and global warming and the role of natural gas. Um, I want to explain to you why hydraulic fracturing is being used so widely, and then I want to talk about the environmental impacts, uh, which you're all very uh, well aware of, and then come back to this issue of natural gas being a bridge uh, to a green future. So this picture shows um, basically uh, where in North America uh, natural gas, natural gas plus liquids, uh, liquid hydrocarbons and oil is being produced. The, the areas in red are what are called dry gas, just gas is produced. The areas in green are places where natural gas technology, the horizontal drilling and the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing I'm about to uh, tell you about is being used to produce oil. In most cases, from well-known and previously uneconomic oil reservoirs. So you know, the natural there's a natural gas revolution going on, which uh, I'll spend my time talking about. But there's a, sort of an unconventional oil re revolution going on. You've all heard about North Dakota, but 6,000 wells were drilled in West Texas last year in uh, an area. You know. Um, well known for oil production, but where oil production has been declining for many decades, and yet now with this technology, many poor quality oil reservoirs, not only in North America, but around the world, are, are, can be exploited. And the areas in the greenish red are where the gas and natural gas liquids have been produced. After 150,000 horizontal wells with multiple hydrofracks, much remains to be learned and done better. Um, recovery factors aren't nearly as good as they should be. In fact, in the, in the, air, in the green areas, the check marks are where my students and I have been working for the last few years. <clears throat> in the green areas, we only recover about 5% of the hydrocarbons. It's economic to do so. That's why um, it, there are thousands of companies are out there doing it. But nonetheless, it, it's, not, it's not good to be uh, uh, you know, leaving 95% of the hydrocarbons behind. When I talk about this with students, I show this slide to uh, frighten them um, and to give them uh, a sense of the scale of the uh, energy and environment challenge. By 2050, when they're roughly the age that I am now, and that frightens them right off the bat, um, they're, they're going to have to help provide the world with about twice as much energy as we use today. So it's not just a matter of converting from dirty you know, fossil fuels to cleaner and renewable sources of energy. We need to do that. But we have to do it while doubling the size of the energy system. 
And that challenge is enormous because we have to do it in a way that respects economic growth, national security issues, environmental concerns, and the concerns of society. So we have to, you know, it's, a, it's an enormous, enormous challenge. And natural gas plays a major role in this transition over the first half of the 20, 21st century. Now, um, if you look around the world and you look at this newly available shale gas resource, and in addition to North America, there's enormous deposits in Argentina, considerable deposits in Colombia. Um, China, fortunately, has huge potential. South Africa, Australia, North Africa, um, Europe, although Europe uh, you know, seems to have a, a, a real fear of fracking and uh, nothing much is happening there. But you, you take this new resource and you add to it conventional natural gas, and lots is being found um, around the world. There's something like 200 years of supply. So the age of natural gas is really just beginning. Now, we don't want to use all this natural gas, but we want to use it as a way of getting from where we are with a, a very uh, dirty uh, energy system. Uh, coal, uh, for example, is, is uh, still, you know, and it is going to be widely used until we can replace it with something like natural gas, which can be done in an economic way, in an environmentally uh, friendly way, and then eventually, of course, decarbonize the energy system altogether. To show you how big this uh, shale gas story is and how rapidly it's come upon us, uh, when you look at gas resources, um, um, you know, over this 40-year period, what you can see is in just in the last decade, it's gone from almost nothing to the point where um, not, not all that long from now, it's going to be uh, over half of all the gas that we use uh, in the United States. And it is currently having simply an enormous impact. These are projections for 2015, but it's 1.5 million jobs, you know, $200 billion to the GDP, $50 billion of direct revenue to uh, federal, state, and local governments. Now, we've known for a long time that if you use gas for making electricity, it's much, much cleaner than sources like coal. And in a lot of places in the world, they're, still, they're actually using oil, diesel, for electricity. But if we just compare coal to uh, natural gas, it produces about half as much uh, CO2 and none of the, nearly none of the SOx and NOx that cause air pollution, none of the mercury, and it's just a much, a much cleaner fuel. And the result of switching from coal to natural gas in the United States in just a few years has our emissions down to early you know, levels from early 1990s. You know, so emissions are going down in the United States because we're switching from a very um, dirty form of electrical power generation to, to um, a much cleaner form. Unfortunately, the coal we're not burning is now being burned in countries like Germany, UK, and China. Now, what do we do about CO2? Um, this has been on our minds for quite a while. In 2005, the IPCC put this um, figure out, showing that one thing we could do is if we captured it from um, different sources like you know, uh, coal burning power plants, refineries, uh, cement factories, etc. We gathered it all up. We can inject it into various geologic formations underground. It's not an easy thing, and it's a very difficult thing. And in 2012, um, a colleague of mine at Stanford, Steve Gorelick, and I published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy that basically said that while there's nothing intrinsically wrong with carbon capture and storage, the scale at which it has to be done in order for it to make a difference on global climate is enormous. The amount of, you know, we, we talk about CCS, carbon capture and storage, to solve about one-seventh or one-eighth of the, of the carbon problem, which means a billion tons of carbon is not emitted into the atmosphere over the next 40 or 50 years. This requires 31 billion barrels of supercritical CO2 to be injected. 31 billion barrels is the same scale of the global oil industry. So we have to recreate the global oil industry 
you know, all the wells, all the pipelines, all the distribution systems in order to, to deal with that. And, you know, it's going to cost trillions of dollars. It's going to take decades to do. And what Steve and I were saying in this paper is that there's actually no place in the subsurface to put this CO2 because the pores, the, the open spaces in the rock, are already filled with brine. And if you start injecting this gas, or it's actually a supercritical liquid, um, we're going to be triggering earthquakes. And you'll see uh, a precursor of that uh, near the end of my talk. So CCS, in our opinion, is too little and too late and at too high a cost to achieve significant emissions. And this is a very nice little paper that was in the MIT Technology Review that shows that as we go to mid-century, if we stay along the red line, which is business as usual, we just, we just double the energy system by doubling what we currently do. Don't change the mix of energies. We're in real trouble. And, um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, expected changes in temperature and sea level are kind of mentioned in the middle. Most of us hope to stabilize uh, carbon emissions over the next couple of decades. Climate modelers would actually like us to, you know, reduce emissions. But that blue wedge is an optimistic wedge of, of what CCS can accomplish. And so, you know, it's, it's extremely costly. It's going to take too long to, have, to be very effective, um, and it may not work anyway. So we need mechanisms that work at large scale that can, you know, operate uh, not immediately and in the, in the decades to come, and that's where gas comes in. So to understand these gas resources, um, we'll start with some simple geology. Basically, the origin of this gas is from there's various ways that it comes about. The most common way is the phytoplankton and other marine organisms, when they die on, in relatively deep water and they fall to the bottom, they get buried in mud, basically in clay-sized particles, before the organic material can oxidize. And that organic material, by getting buried, remains as organic material. And as it get, gets buried further and heated up, it turns into a waxy, um, material called kerogen. And so this kind of black um, ellipse in the middle of the figure here, this is a, a scanning electron micrograph. Um, you can see the scale there, 50 microns. That's, that's a little lens of kerogen in the Eagleford Shale, which is a, a very productive area um, in Texas, just north of the Rio Grande. If you look a little bit more closely, you can see some pits in the kerogen. And if you look clo more closely still, you can see that those pits are actually the pores. They are the, you know, that's the void space through which the gas will flow. And actually, these are large uh, pores. They're about 150 nanometers, extremely, extremely small. And that results in a permeability. Permeability is a measure of how easy, easily um, fluids flow through rock. A permeability that's a million times smaller than a conventional reservoir. So, those of you who know anything about flow through porous media, a, you know, a typical gas reservoir might be 100 millidarcies. Uh, these rocks are 100 nanodarcies. If you've got a granite counter at home, these rocks are 100 times less permeable than your granite kitchen top, OK? <laughs> That's why it's hard to get the gas out. Now, this is a micro CT, the same kind of uh, CT that's used in medical imaging, except it's much higher resolution. On the left, you see the organic content kind of finely distributed through the rock. The red shows the pores. And you can just see how hard it would be for a gas molecule to flow th for, you know, from one side of the image to another. So this is how it's done. It's not to scale. Um, the, the shale layer, shown in black here, is typically a couple hundred feet thick. It's at a depth of oh, 7,000 feet would be uh, on average. So the companies will drill a vertical well and find out where the shale is. Then they'll kick off and drill a horizontal well. Typically, the horizontal wells go about a mile. So you see that it's a mile horizontally, but only a couple hundred feet thick vertically. Then you put some equipment into it, and you hydraulically fracture the rock, starting at what's called the toe. It's obvious to see why it's called the toe, and working your way back to the heel. And it's a typical well today might be hydraulically fractured 20 times. We know how the hydraulic fractures propagate. The interesting thing is these little dots 
represent tiny little micro earthquakes. So you, you use basically water to make the hydrofracks. The water pressure bleeds off into little fractures that already exist in the rock and allows them to slip. Okay? And by making those fractures slip, we can actually change the permeability enough of these very impermeable shales to produce economic quantities. So this is real data. Um, from the northeastern U.S., there's a horizontal well which drilled in a very particular direction because we want the hydraulic fractures to propagate perpendicular. Uh, they started hydraulic fracturing in the upper left and proceeded back toward the uh, lower right. Below this well, there's actually another well, which is kind of unusual, but nonetheless, it was there. And those green uh, diamonds there, which are very regularly spaced, those are seismometers. And the only reason we know these micro-earthquakes occurred is because the seismometers were very close. These earthquakes are so small that they represent the amount of energy of a gallon, as a gallon of milk falling off a kitchen counter, okay? You know, um, don't call 911, okay? Um, so they're very, they're, you know, they're very small events, but cumulatively they, they do change the, the permeability uh, enough. Uh, if you want to think physically, um, they're about uh, this big. This, the fault that slips is about this big, and, it, and it, it slips about a tenth of a millimeter. So lots of gas. And when we look around the world, uh, we see it's, uh, you know, China is just enormous, U.S. and Canada combined. And that's really good news because China's energy co consumption is going to double uh, before the rest of the world, even with their, you know, their, the slowing of their economy. And if their <clears throat> use of energy doubles in the next 20 or so years, their emissions are going to go, their CO2 emissions are going to go from 7 gigatons per year to 14 gigatons per year. Now, we currently emit about 2 gigatons per year. So if we go from 2 to 0, and China goes from 7 to 14, it's game over when it comes to, you know, um, global emissions. So um, I, just, I was in China last week and, and, and you know, moving China forward on, on development of their uh, domestic shale gas um, resources is, is in everybody's best interest. Of course, China has a tremendous pollution problem as well. Something over a million people are dying prematurely due to respiratory disease. In this country, we spend 60-some billion dollars a year on the health effects uh, due to burning coal. So, you know, switching from coal to natural gas makes a lot of sense. But the extraction process, horizontal drilling, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, is a large-scale industrial process and in large-scale industrial processes um, have um, environmental uh, impacts. This is a pad in the northeastern United States. It's, it's kind of a big one, but what happens is you, you clear off what might be five or seven acres, and then on this pad, you, you might drill 12 wells, and the rig and all the drilling equipment comes in, and they'll actually drill 12 wells, six in one direction and six in the other direction. I mean, sometimes they drill more, sometimes they, they drill less. But you can see how efficient that is. They, you know, they, they only have to move the equipment to one place, there's only one road, there's only one pipeline, and so on. Then, after those wells are drilled, you remove all the drilling equipment and you bring in the hydraulic fracturing equipment, which is shown here, and the tanks and the fluids and the pumps and all the rest. And then each well will be fractured, say, 20 times. So there might be 250 hydrofracs, you know, carried out from this one, one site. And then, you know, after a couple of months of a lot of noise and a lot of traffic, it's all over. So this is a, an old well pad. Um, these images are... Um, uh, just off the web uh, in, in Pennsylvania. And then afterwards, uh, the land is restored. It's not perfect, but, you know, it's largely restored. You know, the gas, there's a wellhead there, and there's a connection to a pipeline. But, but, but pretty much, um, you know, the, uh, the impact uh, lasts for, for a few months. <clears throat> 